She was losing her life. The pain I experienced every single day was beyond excruciating. Can't lift a fork, I'm completely incapacitated. Some doctors say they have chronic Lyme disease. Others say there's no such thing. We were being ignored by doctors. You know, doctors like calling you crazy. The News 4i team exposes the Lyme Wars, a battle in the medical community, leaving patients paying the price. A special multi-part I-team investigation starts Monday at 5.30. A disease that touches thousands here in our area, but there are some bitter fights over who has it and how to treat it. And yesterday we explored the battle over chronic Lyme. Tonight, how both sides are digging in and the government's response. As News 4's Natalie Pascarella reports, this part of the Lyme Wars is one of heartbreak and hope. I didn't want to get out of bed anymore. It all became very pointless, like an endless cycle that I couldn't escape. Six months ago, Kyra Lerner never imagined, couldn't fathom that she would be sitting here. I really just wanted to lock myself in my room forever and disappear. When you decided I want to go public with this, what is this about talking about this? It's really about helping everyone and making the awareness of the disease itself more known. It's a really terrifying thing, and I, I know that now. An upbeat teen with a love of sailing and photography and the daughter of WNBC president and general manager Eric Lerner, Kyra didn't know what to think when the first signs of trouble flickered. There was kind of a low-key anxiety that followed me around everywhere I went. And then other symptoms started coming on. For a while, I had no idea, didn't know what was going on with me. Her doctors and parents didn't either. I went to doctors for a depression problem, and I got antidepressants and anxiety medication, but nothing really happened. There was other doctors I went to see to try and figure out what the headaches were, what the fever-like symptoms were. As harrowing handwritten notes by Kyra's mother reveal, her symptoms would soon get far worse. That's because her doctor now says she was suffering from an insidious, undiagnosed case of chronic Lyme disease. You see so many different presentations of Lyme disease, but really when it comes down to it, you have the patient who is a case history of one. This one was so unusual, Dr. Stephen Bach alerted a state Senate committee investigating Lyme and tick-borne illnesses. I had a 15-year-old young lady brought to me by her parents. She was an A student and she had depression, severe depression on four medicines. Bach says Kyra is also a case study in the Lyme Wars. Despite 30 years of treating Lyme in the Hudson River Valley, many doctors don't buy his diagnosis. It's just amazing how there's this dichotomy of one field that says there's no such thing as chronic Lyme and the other who says that Lyme is the great imitated. Bach is secretary of the International Lyme and Associated Diseases Society, or ILADS. Its 650 doctors believe bacteria from infected tick bites can hide in the body, and FDA-approved blood tests are often unreliable. That is incorrect. On the other side, doctors like Sunil Sood, who belong to the Infectious Diseases Society of America, or IDSA. It's more than 11,000 doctors believe Lyme is fairly easy to diagnose and can usually be treated in a month. The IDSA guidelines carry extra weight because they're followed by the CDC. Connecticut Senator Richard Blumenthal believes the debate is paralyzing government's response to a public health crisis. The biggest frustration for me is the lack of adequate diagnosis. As state attorney general, Blumenthal fought the IDSA over its treatment guidelines. While he lost that war, he believes a new federal task force created at the behest of Connecticut and New York senators is an important step. This task force will have experts, doctors, researchers, government officials, but also patients. The task force will also address funding. There's little debate Lyme gets a pittance in federal research dollars compared to other infectious diseases. It really needs and deserves the kind of financial investment from the government that will develop better diagnosis, 
and more effective treatment. Dr. Box says the dollars that do flow tend to go one way. I think a lot of the money goes to IDSA physicians who are doing the same research and supporting kind of the same conclusions. Any conclusion, any answer. That's what Kyra was desperate for earlier this year. Forced to leave school, hiding most of the day in her room, her body ached and her mind spiraled even further. There was one day that I walked into the store with my dad and I go, is it raining in here? It felt like there was water like coming, sprinkling on my hands. In the grocery store. In the grocery store. <laughs> Finally, this spring, after months of seeing other doctors, Kyra found Dr. Bach. His blood tests found she had two tick-borne diseases. I made clinically a diagnosis, you know, that this is Lyme, and then uh, started treating her with uh, oral medicines, which she responded to about 50%. There were small little things that began to happen. Like, I think some of my mind began to clear up. Kyra also got antibiotics through what's called a pick line, a constant drip in her arm. It was the boost she needed. My bones, my joints, things started to stop hurting as much. The fatigue began to lift. I had more of a desire to do things and kind of my old personality started coming back to me. While still taking pills and supplements to restore her body, Kyra says she's been forever changed by Lyme. I think it's good to have examples out there like me to show what can be done and what should be done because I made such progress, so it's possible that other people can too. Another sign of progress, the fact Kyra is sitting here in a marina on the Long Island Sound where she's finally planning to sail again. Do you recognize the person you were? at one of their lowest points? It's a completely different person to me. My mind is clear, I'm more happy, I can feel happy again, and I see a future for myself again. Natalie Pascarella, News 4 New York. And we want to share more good news. Two weeks after Kyra talked with Natalie, she went back to see Dr. Bach, had her pick line for antibiotics removed, and she's also back in school part-time. She's hoping to ramp up to a full schedule in the next two weeks. You know, Stacey, I think we all heard of Lyme disease, but this tug of war in the yes. medical community and the impact on families, I, you know, I for one, I, I didn't really know. Well, and, and you know, kudos to her parents. Any parent would do it staying on the doctors until they figured it out, That's and right. she's going to be a lifelong advocate for other people out there. Turn to an I-team investigation that could help you or someone you love. It's estimated that 300,000 people are infected every year with Lyme disease from tick bites, and the tri-state is a hot zone. But lost in the warnings, confusion about who's actually sick and how to treat them. From doctor's offices in Washington, D.C., the I-team has found a disarray at every level. Here now with the story is News 4 Stephen Holt. Hi, Jumi. Hi, David. With so many people touched by this disease, there's a good chance you know a victim of the Lyme Wars. For months, the I-team has been investigating why and how patients are paying the price especially in this fight over chronic Lyme. We're tackling this all in a five-part series every day this week at this time. And we're going to start tonight with a harrowing story of a brave young woman who got sick and felt she was under attack. Atovaquan, Coralinol, Minrex, far enough, damp, and should know them like the back of my hand. For the Brzezzi family in Brooklyn, it's become a weekly ritual. An assembly line on the kitchen table dividing up pills and supplements for 14-year-old Julia. I take 70 pills a day. It's necessary, her doctor says, because Lyme disease and infections caused by it are ravaging her body. So bad, she's unable to walk. Lyme is known as the great imitator. It can look like lupus. It can look like rheumatoid arthritis. It can look like multiple sclerosis. It can cause psychiatric symptoms. It's a view that made Dr. Richard Horowitz a hero to thousands of patients and a renegade in the medical world. The Hudson Valley internist is a renowned proponent of what's commonly called chronic Lyme, that bacteria from infected tick bites can hide inside the body, even go dormant and wreak havoc months or years later. People call us crazy, you know, people call me crazy. Julia's nightmare began two years ago, seemingly out of nowhere. I was a dancer, you know, I was a sports player, I was active. And then, you know, suddenly, in like a second, my life just changed. In class one day, her legs went numb, followed by fevers, joint pain, exhaustion, and hair loss. I must have brought Julia to at least 60, 70 different specialists and doctors. 
From the looks of her, she was losing her life. Lyme disease was suspected since Julia once had a bullseye rash, often a red flag. But doctors had dismissed it then, and now blood tests were negative. There was no explanation for her condition. These doctors were calling it psychological. They were saying she was faking it. They tried to convince me that I was making it up. I realized that the only shot that Julia had was me. Convinced that Julia had chronic Lyme, her father decided to fight back, only to find himself right in the middle of a mind-boggling medical war. On one side, doctors like Horowitz, who believe in chronic Lyme and say it can be hard to diagnose and to treat. And on the other side, the Centers for Disease Control and much of the medical establishment, including doctors like Gary Wormser. There's a lot of misinformation out there about Lyme disease. Recently, in the American Journal of Medicine, he equated some of the chronic Lyme conversation to fake news. In terms of the patients I see referred to me for uh, chronic Lyme, I, a lot of the patients I see don't have any evidence of ever having had Lyme. Wormser is chief of infectious diseases at New York Medical College. He never treated Julia, but he influenced many who did. Wormser was a lead author of Lyme treatment guidelines, followed by the CDC. They say it's fairly easy to diagnose, and most patients can be cured in 10 to 28 days with antibiotics. Maybe coming a little closer. David Benson, a father in Morris County, New Jersey, could be a case study. I tested positive back in April. Fatigue and a bad rash were among his symptoms. I did 30 days of antibiotics, and I was, I was feeling pretty good after that. He does have a few lingering problems, which the CDC calls post-Lyme disease syndrome. But for people like Julia, who never tested positive, the official line is that she has a different or new illness. Either we have no explanation or they have another illness. The medical system essentially is broken. At the heart of the Lyme war is a disagreement over blood tests approved by the FDA to detect Lyme. If you've been sick for months and months, the laboratory test should be positive. The science is there. The science is there that the testing is unreliable. The government says the tests are reliable, but the accuracy depends upon the stage of the disease and often don't detect Lyme until four weeks after an infected tick bite. To Julia's father, that sounded like mad science. My only one goal was to get Julia treatment. He found it with a Lyme specialist who used different blood tests that found Julia was positive for Lyme and for four other tick-borne diseases. And on the first week of treatment, you know, I got my upper body back. I was able to feel my toes. But with that step forward, the Brzezis hit new minefields. I couldn't get better because we couldn't afford it and the insurance company wouldn't cover it. It was really hopeless. You know, I felt like I, wouldn't, I was going to stay like that forever. I was just going to die. But in her darkest hour, when her treatment wasn't blessed by the medical powers, Julia says a higher one came to her rescue. Invited to meet Pope Francis during his trip to New York in 2015. She says this moment, aired live on News 4, changed everything. He's going to give me a miracle. He came over and touched me, and I you know, was asking for a miracle, and I didn't get up and walk. I was all over the news. The coverage triggered an outpouring of help and led her to Dr. Horowitz, who cleared a spot at his years-long waiting list. In Julia's case, because the nerves have been severely affected for her lower extremities, it's going to take a while. It can take years for the nerves to regrow. My sense is with good physical therapy, she will be able to start to walk. I dream of Julia walking. You know, I, I, um, I envision her standing and, you know, posing for a picture. Julia has faith and incredibly even bigger dreams. I think everything happens for a reason. And, you know, I think God gave me this this thing and now I have to use it you know now I see like what my mission is to do you know to help other people there's such a controversy with Lyme disease and so many people suffer in silence you know that don't deserve it Julia's right there is so much controversy over Lyme disease and tomorrow right here on News 4 we are investigating how doctors are digging in on both sides and how government could be doing more to help resolve and now we turn to the Lyme Wars, a disease shrouded in mystery, despite hundreds of thousands of cases every year, many of them right here in the tri-state. All week, the I-Team has shown us the controversy, the bitter fights in the medical world, and the patients who suffer because of it. Tonight, News 4's Erica Byfield has an exclusive look at cutting-edge science that could give everyone hope.
Inside the Johns Hopkins Medical Center in Baltimore, the keys to understanding Lyme disease and possibly curing it are in deep freeze. In here we have samples of these are blood cells from our patients. At the Lyme Disease Research Center, these vials are everything. We have over 40,000 blood samples in our freezer, and so these blood samples are the precious material that researchers need to develop better diagnostic tests, to develop prognostic tests, to understand what's causing these lingering chronic symptoms. A primary focus of research is people like New Yorker Dana Parrish. I had no knowledge of what could really happen if you had a severe case of Lyme. Did you show it from the top? The singer-songwriter who's written hits for Dina Menzel and Celine Dion nearly lost everything to Lyme disease. Her nightmare began in 2014 after a trip to Long Beach Island when she saw a bullseye rash and raced to the doctor. They said, you're right, it's Lyme. Don't worry, and thought I'd be fine. They said I'd be fine. Within a few months, despite taking antibiotics, everything got worse. Horrible anxiety, panic attacks, depression, insomnia, uh, hallucinations before I went to bed, profound muscle weakness, uh, joint pain. Oh, heart failure, my most horrifying symptom. The list goes on and on, as it can with what the Centers for Disease Control calls post-treatment Lyme disease syndrome. Parrish is not part of the Johns Hopkins study, but hundreds who've had similar problems are. Patients can have chronic symptoms for years or even decades. To start counting cells like this. Finding out why is the mission. Doctors say early evidence is pointing towards issues with the immune system. That's really intriguing to us because if their symptoms are being driven by an immune reaction. Um, there are lots of ways that we have now to control immune responses. It's got our antennae way up. Unlocking mysteries of the immune system could help resolve the battle over chronic Lyme, which many doctors and the CDC say doesn't exist. I think the debate in the community really comes down to our lack of knowledge, honestly. You know, if we had the research uh, results available to actually understand the causation of those chronic symptoms, then I think the debate would kind of go away. Much of the debate over chronic Lyme would also go away with better testing, also a focus of the center. The diagnostic tests for Lyme disease definitely need to be improved. Right now, the currently commonly available diagnostic test is an antibody test. You're not looking at the actual infectious bacteria, you're looking at the immune system response to the bacteria. Being able to spot the Lyme bacteria long after a tick bite is the holy grail. Let's just say you could find it in their blood four years later. Could it then be deemed chronic? That would be a remarkable discovery. And so far, that's been elusive. For people like Dana, who's nearly recovered and back to singing, the work at Johns Hopkins is vital. But she says Lyme patients can't wait for science to save them. You can get better. But you have to find a Lyme literate doctor and you have to listen to yourself, listen to your heart, be persistent, ask questions, don't be afraid of doctor. I'll never stop looking over my shoulder until there's a cure. Doctors here believe a cure will one day be possible and they hope these blood samples will be the key. Uh, they can be stay at this state for decades. They will outlive us. These samples can be archived for years and years for studies down the road. Studies maybe we haven't even imagined being able to do yet. Just alarming to see all of the symptoms and the side effects. And, you know, Dana caught it early and she yeah. still dealt with it. So a Lyme literate doctor. Good thing to remember. Indeed. And that was Erica Byfield reporting that. Lyme wars. All week, the I-Team has been investigating the battle over Lyme disease. And tonight we have an eye-opening look at a haven for Lyme-infected ticks. It focuses on a shrub that grows wild in the woods and is especially popular in home gardens. As News 4's Brian Thompson discovered... It's a danger lurking in plain sight. I would pull ticks off me every day, sometimes one, sometimes up to ten. As a Parks police officer in Morris County, New Jersey, Margie Raimondi battled an enemy that few cops face. And I'd be like, oh my God, I'm getting them like as, as if you would swat a mosquito, I'm getting ticks like that. It was somewhere in the woods, she believes, that she contracted Lyme disease from one of those ticks. I was four and a half, half months bedbound. I mean, I was skinny as a rail, gray as ash. My children had to, like, escort me to the bathroom because I couldn't even walk that far. While still recovering and on disability, Margie now wonders if these prickly, scrubby, dense little plants called Japanese barberry played a role in her illness. It's an invasive. It, it, it grows all over New Jersey. I call it the ecological perfect storm for 
tick-borne diseases. Dr. Scott Williams, one of the leading experts on Japanese barbarian in the U.S., a top researcher for the state of Connecticut, Williams has found tick populations in areas thick with the plant that are five times higher than those without it. The ticks are astronomically high abundances. The number of infected ticks, he says, is also off the charts, 12 times higher in an acre of forest with Japanese barberry. That's because ticks like the higher humidity under the bushes, and mice, which are primary carriers of the Lyme bacteria, like it too. So that combination of being good for the ticks, good for the mice. It could be an especially bad combination in Morris County, which has the highest number of Lyme disease cases in the state and one of the highest rates in the country. Dr. Mike Van Clef is a New Jersey ecologist and invasive plant expert. If you're a person who works in the forest all the time, you're going to be aware that it's a risk. If you get it in your backyard gardening, you're not even thinking about it. I specifically bought the Japanese barberry plant because deer wouldn't eat it. Morris County dad David Benson is like countless people across New Jersey who've used the plant for landscaping. Prized for its color, durability, and affordability, it's a hot seller at garden centers. I bought a whole bunch. Uh, I planted one here and uh, by my like basement windows. He also contracted Lyme disease this year. While he doesn't know if the bushes were connected to his infection, he wonders... If it's something that harbors ticks, and ticks harbor infectious diseases, why, why sell them? In fact, six states have banned or are phasing out the sale or import of Japanese barberry, including New York and Connecticut. But in New Jersey, the I-Team found attempts to ban or limit Japanese barberry and other invasives have died on the vine. The politics of it haven't worked out. In 2007, Van Cleff wrote the plan for the Garden State with the blessing of then Governor John Corzine. The New Jersey Invasive Species Council even rolled out recommendations in early 2010. But then... And we had a shift in administration. The council was abolished. Governor Christie's office told the I-Team the council was disbanded because, quote, its specific mission was completed and the work of actually addressing invasive species has continued to be addressed by various state, county, and local agencies, as well as through various partnerships. A partnership with the nursery industry, which grows and sells barberry, is what Van Cleff wants to see. The idea was to sort of have a phase-out kind of system where if something was deemed invasive, then there would be a phase-out period. You know, ultimately, I hope that's what happens. Um, you still have your fingers crossed. I, I, I do. For Margie, who showed the I-Team the collection of medications she's taken to combat Lyme disease, what comes next is also elusive. I, I don't have a future plan. Law enforcement was my plan. Take care of my family, take care of my kids, take care of my health, you know? Obviously, try to help people with Lyme disease best I can. In Morris County, Brian Thompson, News 4 New York. The dumping of that medication in that bucket yes. speaks volumes. It really does. So two out of the three states in the tri-state have banned it. We'll see how it evolves in New Jersey. Hopefully getting this word out at least makes people aware of it. Hidden enemies in the Lyme Wars. This week the I-Team has been investigating a disease that touches so many in the tri-state. Yes, but that's not the only danger from infected tick bites. News 4's Stefan Holt is here. And Stefan, you have new information about what doctors, what has them sounding the alarm. That's right, Stacey and David. Lyme disease is by far the most common and the most well-known tick-borne illness. But experts are telling us there is growing concern about other diseases and infections. Some can even be deadly. He was the rock of our family. There wasn't a thing that that man wouldn't do. He loved each and every one of his grandchildren. Four months after the death of her father, Charles, Stephanie Smith is still stunned by the fact he's gone and how he died. You could understand if it was a heart attack or this or that, but a little bug took his life. This little bug destroyed our lives, really. That little bug, an infected deer tick that bit Charles near their family home in Saratoga County, New York. It was a purple spot on his arm, probably the size of a half dollar. So it wasn't like your typical like red rash. His was like a purpley color, very sore. Doctors didn't know what to make of it. They ran every test known to mankind, came back, everything came back negative right down to the actual modern day Lyme testing that we have, came back negative. That's because state authorities eventually realized Charles had been infected with another tick-borne disease called Powassan. Two other people in the area were also infected. This is the first time that Powassan has been found in ticks in Saratoga County. Powassan is 
very rare. Dr. Gary Wormser is chief of infectious diseases at New York Medical College and one of the state's top experts on tick-borne diseases. He says Powassan is among the threats that are creeping up. In Westchester in the lower Hudson Valley of New York, we have five different deer tick transmitted infections. In addition to Lyme, he's alarmed by Powassan, Ehrlichiosis, Borrelia miyamotoi, and Babesiosis. By far the most important one in our area is Babesiosis which is also flown under the radar. Most of the general public doesn't know about it, and it can kill you. Symptoms can be similar to Lyme disease, but there's a chilling twist with babesiosis. 25% of adults have no symptoms with babesiosis, and in fact, they pose a risk to the blood supply because if they donate blood, they may still transmit babesiosis to a blood recipient. In Connecticut, a different infection called Bartonella worries Lyme disease doctor Stephen Phillips. Bartonella gets confused with, with Lyme so frequently, the symptoms overlap like 90%. And Bartonella is a disease that is completely ignored by the medical community. The Centers for Disease Control says there's no convincing evidence ticks can transmit Bartonella to humans. Phillips, a leader in treating chronic Lyme, is not surprised. Bartonella is kind of where Lyme was 30 years ago. The research for, for Bartonella is pretty much non-existent. Health officials acknowledge the fear and confusion is compounded by this reality. For tick-borne agents other than Lyme disease, there are very few FDA-approved methods. More research, everyone agrees, is critical. And Dr. Phillips has another suggestion. They teach us in med school that 90% of the, you know, the important data that we get from our patients is just by listening to them. It's not from the blood test, it's not from the physicals. And somehow, doctors have forgotten that. Back in Saratoga County, Stephanie Smith hopes someone is listening to her, paying attention to this. The thing I miss the most is just being able to talk to them. Tom, I love you. Her father, Charles, spent nearly a month in the hospital after that tick bite, but as his body failed, doctors couldn't save him. We cannot bring him back, but you know what? Maybe we can help somebody else. Maybe out there there's an ear. Somebody will listen to us so somebody else doesn't have to go through the hurt and the pain that our family's gone through. Education and prevention experts say that's the key to stay safe. Learn all you can about tick-borne illnesses. And after you've been outside, especially in a wooded area, check your body, check your kids, check your pets for ticks. You can find more information on this and the entire five-part I-Team investigation on our website, NBCNewYork.com. There's also much more on the NBC4 app. I think this has been an eye-opener no for so many things going on. I mean, think of one little bug that can change so many people's lives, and still there's a lot of confusion. There's a lot of debate about this going on now, yeah. something that everyone should know about. Yeah, and we've learned from the stories families have to keep asking questions. That's as frustrating exactly. as is and stay on top. Keep asking those questions. Okay.